Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com This is Daily Hypnotic Buffet 2018 This is day number 7 I think I'm beginning to lose track of the days So I'm recording this I keep trying different things to see what I can do as far as making it sound a bit better because I've been recording on the iPhone and apart from the lack of light in this room which does make a picture a little bit grainy uh, if I had more light the picture would be really good um, that's something I need <laughs> to work on I need to sort that out so the if I did this in the kitchen, I'd probably have a, or in the bathroom, that would be a lot brighter, but it would be really echoey, and um, I think part of the the benefit of living in a, a flat with a separate bedroom and a separate kitchen and a separate living room and a separate bathroom and a hallway and all that stuff in a storage room is that I don't have to record videos in the bathroom which is what I used to do because you know a few years back or 2011 I recorded a lot of my stuff in the bathroom because that was the only room that was quiet because it, I had an ensuite there I had a, a bedroom and a bathroom and that was part of the rent what I rented um, £125 a week that cost me and the toilet broke after about three weeks and it wasn't through excessive poo it was just normal usage and it just broke because basically what they did is they converted a house into something that it shouldn't really have been it wasn't built for accommodating lots of toilets and bathrooms anyway I digress so hope you're all okay just let you know before we start this that you will be able to watch this on YouTube Vimeo I will post the videos onto Facebook Twitter Google Plus and a few other places you'll also be able to watch this video and download the audio list stream the audio on my website jasonnewland.com and you'll also be able to listen and stream and download the audio on iTunes and SoundCloud and a few other ones as well. But I put those links with every video that I do, every session I do, I put all the different links where you can get this, get that same session. Right, only watch or listen to this one, you can safely close your eyes. tell you the main thing that I've been thinking about and I know I really shouldn't talk about this on a video because the that seems to uh, it can fuel it can fuel people's uh, motivation or you know it's, it's the thing is when sometimes when people find out it's something you don't like and that bully the bullies would use that and do more of that and or just people that are insensitive and I've done it myself in the past so it's not not like and I don't, wouldn't never class myself as a bully but sometimes they find out something and they'll keep saying it and they keep doing it and it's just maybe it's funny to start with and then it gets very very boring um, and annoying so I'm slightly affected when I get a dislike on a YouTube video and I know that YouTube isn't really the main place anymore for me my videos are on Vimeo they're safe on there all every single video that I managed to save so I hope the 700 videos are on Vimeo my Vimeo website all my videos are on my website my normal website all of my audios are on iTunes and SoundCloud and stuff like that so 
I, I started putting some of the, the latest the buffet videos on YouTube. So I got a, a dislike on yesterday's video. And I had this little twinge, it's a little little twinge of oh, because there was a time when everything was based about YouTube for me. Everything was all about YouTube, and I didn't. At times, I didn't even pay any attention to the website. For my own website, it was just YouTube, 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 trying to reach the largest audience possible. Um, and although that audience will can you know continue to grow as it is growing but slowly I'm not giving it the energy or the attention uh, that isn't my focus I'm putting it on YouTube and put my videos my new videos on YouTube just so those on video on YouTube that watch what I do and like what I do can see it um, so yeah but I had this little oh someone disliked it and because no one else had liked the video and we're talking, I'm getting very few viewers on YouTube, like only like 20, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30, you know, on a, on a video eventually, um, which is just tiny amounts compared to what I used to get when I had an audience, you know, subscribers and stuff. Uh, I think I've got 22 subscribers, so it's, you know, I'm not, I've not got a lot of people following me on YouTube at the moment. Uh, on iTunes and SoundCloud, I get you know, a nice, nice number of people downloading and listening every day. Uh, about fifteen hundred plays a week, roughly, and another few, three, four hundred downloads. So it's it's quite you know it's quite nice. So, but I still got that little doubt, that little ooh ooh. I'm not sure how to. <laughs> Oh, really? Just uh. and then doubt. That big shadow doubt appeared, and I was laying in bed last night, or well, actually, it was early hours this morning. And I was just thinking, and that same old thought, the feeling, the process that used to kick in. I say used to in the past, but even recently, but this, that, oh, what am I doing? Is this just, perhaps I should stop doing this? Am I doing harm? Am I, am, am I hurting people? And I'm, is it just pointless? Am I wasting my time? And should, you know, but I kind of know what my aim is. And this is just the beginning with these hypnotic buffets. I have done hypnotic buffets before, by the way. Uh, if you go to my website, I've done, I did, what, 17 or maybe more of them over the years. Um, but this is more like every day now, June 2018. And I really started thinking, oh, and I thought, what would it be like if I was an entertainer? A singer, maybe, or maybe a motivational speaker, or I don't know, something. And I was on stage, and you know, I had maybe 200 people or a thousand people watching me, and one person out of that thousand people was booing. Would I then just give everything up, walk off stage? It's interesting, isn't it? When the negative is outweighed by the positive so much, you know, always has been. And everything I've done online, even if I've had um, some dislikes, it's usually on a video. If I've got a dislike, 20 dislikes, I might have maybe 600 likes. Or, you know, so it's always outweighed, you know, in the past that was. So. I don't know. Just got me thinking. That self doubt that entered my brain, entered my mind. Or maybe it didn't enter my mind. Maybe it was just there, waiting. And there's that self sabotaging part of me. 
which kicks in. So I don't know about you, I don't know if you've got these things happening to you sometimes. I'm sure um, a lot of people maybe watching this, listening to this, will think, well, yeah, we've perhaps all got this to various degrees. And it's about how much it affects us, isn't it? It's about how, what does, what does it do to us? How does it affect your life? How does it limit our happiness? So yeah, so that's what I was thinking about today. That's what I thought I'd talk about. So apart from that, everything's okay. I woke up at five this afternoon again. It's two days in a row I've done that. Uh, but I was up all night last night. It might seem, it really might seem like making a video that may last an hour of me just rabbiting on blah, 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 blah. But there's a lot more to do after that. It's once I've done it, having to upload it, and I've talked about this, so I won't go over it again, but it's very time consuming, actually. It takes, you know, getting all the links, putting the links together, linking the links. You know, but making it so that people can find the stuff and since I've been doing this my Vimeo account my Vimeo website has increased so I'm getting a lot more people watching my videos now on Vimeo which is nice they might be watching via my website so I'm not sure if they're because all the videos on my website are from Vimeo so they're all embedded or you, people might be going directly to the Vimeo website for whatever reason, it's it's nice to see activity growing. Uh, the same as with the audios as well. So that's that's nice to see more people are following me on SoundCloud and. Um, what's weird though is with Facebook, I hardly ever get any um, comments or likes or any. Recog not recognition, but no nothing when I post a video on there generally. But if I post a picture of Andre with his little tongue out looking just incredibly cute, that's when people like, that's what people want, want to see. So those are the things that people on my Facebook like. I don't think anybody watches any of my videos or anything. It's, uh, it's quite weird really. Um, considering this is the only reason I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Twitter, I've got about 800, just under 800 followers on Twitter, which is a tiny amount, I know. But even then, I get the odd like every now and then. I get the odd like on a post. It's, I think with Twitter, it's turned much more into celebrities, following celebrities on there. Or famous people, um, and there's quite a bit of controversy, arguments, and people just posting stuff just to get attention, I guess, um, which is probably fun for them. But I'm just trying to make videos to help people, and it's a bit I need to figure a way of getting out there, man. So if you want to share what I do, then please do share this, uh, these videos, audios, whatever. Self-doubt. What? A... I was going to say what a horrible thing. I mean, I can only talk from my own perspective. But if we change the word horrible for harmful. I'd say that's a correct, the correct title for self-doubt. And I'm sure self-doubt isn't always harmful, it's sometimes very useful, especially if you're planning to do something that may be very dangerous and um, maybe having a little bit of self-doubt would be a good thing in some circumstances, for example, if 
I was going to have a fight with a polar bear. And I thought, yeah, I can take the polar bear. I can knock the polar bear out. Hopefully, a bit of self-doubt when I see this polar bear is about 20 foot tall and, you know, 30 times my size. And I think, oh, I've got quite big teeth. And maybe that self-doubt in my mind would stop me from being eaten and uh, ripped to pieces. That would be a good thing, self-doubt in that situation. Self-doubt during a driving test could be a reason for failing the driving test because you need to have confidence generally to get through a test, especially something like a driving test where you've got someone next to you, someone you never met before maybe, kind of just staring at you and watching you the whole time. There needs to be some self-confidence there. If self-doubt kicks in while you're doing that, then it could be uh, a bad result, an unhappy result. So self-doubt can be a good thing, it can be a, a harmful thing. But self-doubt, I think in a sense of a driving test or driving less, you know, test, something like that, it's not, it may affect your life short term, but you can have another test. Self-doubt, you know, if someone, if there's something you really, really want to do, it could be as simple, but at the same time as life-changing as wanting to ask somebody out on a date it might even be somebody that is making it obvious that they like you and that they'd like to spend time with you get to know you yet there's that self-doubt maybe uh, kicks in I had that years ago I don't just like maybe they why do they like me and maybe I shouldn't do this and it's just go I'm good I think that's a good example of the sound it's not helpful and the opportunities that I had missed I got offered years and years and years ago in the 90s about 93 I was doing comedy and or tempting to do comedy I suppose like I'm attempting to do hypnosis but I met this lady who was a BBC producer so she worked for the BBC you know the British Broadcasting Corporation and she we became friends because she was also a comedian and we became friends and she liked me not not romantically um, but she liked me to the point where she wanted to make a, like, not a film, but she wanted to make a, a documentary about me, because that's what she did, she made documentaries. And she wanted to do a documentary of my life, a documentary of the life of a young comedian that isn't doing particularly well, doesn't have any money, doesn't have any support network, and kind of wanted to do that and see thought I might come across quite well at the time I mean she, she offered it to me it would have been something that she she had the camera she had all the equipment and she was ready to go and do it she just wanted to do it she wanted to come into my work and film me at work so I had a job as well film me at home film me going to gigs and you know just just film me just doing my day-to-day -day life and uh I was worried about my nan finding out what I was really like. I was so worried that about my nan seeing me swearing and smoking and maybe even smoking stuff I shouldn't have been smoking that I turned her down. I said no. This was an opportunity. You think, how many people would absolutely, what 
they would give for the opportunity to have a BBC documentary all about themselves and I turned it down because I was I didn't believe in myself I didn't think that anybody would want to watch me I didn't I was worried about what my family would think especially my nan I was um, I was concerned that I would get a negative response and it would ruin my chances of any kind of a career in comedy I was worried I'd come across as bad but then you know in a bad light but then I was friends with the producer it wasn't some stranger that came up to me saying yeah I really like you I want to do a thing I actually was friends with her I, used to, I went to her home and we used to hang out with each other so she was my friend and she I don't think she would have uh, done a hatchet job on me at all I really don't she was she was a lovely person well, still is I'm sure I haven't seen her for a long time so I didn't have any self-belief so I didn't do it it was uh, an opportunity possibly of a lifetime but I didn't take it and then later on still friends with her she wanted to write a sitcom asked me to write a sitcom with her she could get this sitcom not necessarily get it made but she definitely had the contacts to get it reviewed and hopefully get it made she was you know she had the contacts for that again didn't believe in myself I had no self belief so I turned that down <laughs> it's so in two and in 2008 2009 I saw her again when she came and she spent time with me and my friend Kevin and she wanted to make a, f a film about us two it's really she wanted to make a documentary again I'll turn it down I just and she said about us making a sitcom she really wanted to do something with me from 2003 to 2008 or 2009 something like that um, 1993 to 1990 Eight, ninety-nine. So it's quite a long period of time where she was really, you know, made an effort with me, and I just turned down the opportunity. So I didn't believe in myself. So I'm very much in tune with maybe some of the damage that uh, that negative self-talk has done to me has had an effect on me that's my own mind it's my own words but then where do those words come from there's lots of theories lots of theories psychological theories that we take on the voice of people that we have been affected by in the past like parents teachers uh, siblings you know brothers sisters other people, kids at school, people at work, bosses, supervisors, you know, those kinds of people. And I guess that is quite a big theory. It's not necessarily a theory. It's, it's based upon really what I was talking about yesterday in what we say to each other affects each other. What you say to someone can have an effect on them. What they say to you can affect you. We can't not affect each other with communication. We, we that's how, what communication is: is having an effect. Whether it's a tiny, just an annoyance, to, uh, or a nice feeling arising, or maybe someone could say something to you that actually stays with you forever, for your entire life. That stays with you. That just one might be a sentence might be an idea I think when I first started getting into hypnosis there's a, there's a hypnotist called Milton H Erickson and he I got into hypnosis quite a long time before I got into pretty much nine years before I got into counseling and 
the one thing that Milton H. Erickson kept saying and kept really referring back to was that everybody is different. And from a, a superficial perspective, like, yeah, of course everyone's different. But if you examine it, if you really go into it, really kind of give it some thought, some give it some welly, as they say, everybody's different. And that, that goes for our responses, for what's going on in our mind. It's different to the person you're talking to. And even while watching the same television program, you've got different things going on in your mind, you're perhaps going to understand it differently or notice different things. And it might be very, very subtle, very subtle, but we, we experience the world differently. And people like uh, some of the psychologists and things were like NLP, um, Neuro Linguistic Programming, Richard Bandler, John Grindo, and all the people that came after that, and all you know, there's a lot of um, been focusing on the very like the auditory, visual, uh, kinesthetic, like the feelings uh, side of things. Some people are predominantly more visual, some people are predominantly more auditory, so they'd maybe be more uh, of a talker, maybe more of a listener even. Although a lot of people that talk, do a lot of talking don't listen so much, so that can kind of go both ways. But and some people are really into feelings. I've got pain in my right eye. Oh. I'll tell you what it is. I've got the, the glare on, my f on the screen is a lot brighter than normal. Can you see? <sighs> see it in, the, in my in my glasses. Oh, by the way, if you are listening to this on iTunes, and you wonder what I look like, like move, you know, don't take it. Please, do. some of the pictures I don't think do me huge justice. I mean, I'm a bit more animated than just a still picture, so you can see that my face moves and stuff. You know. Um, I've never took a good picture ever. I'm not saying I take a good video either, but I think I look better in a video than I do in a picture, just because you can see it's a human being, not just a still, you know, because, anyway. So watch my videos if you want. The theory behind some of these uh, changing of states especially with regard in hypnosis is if you're a predominantly visual person then you know lying back sitting down in your chair with your eyes closed you could you know start the hypnosis session easily by focusing on you know walking down some stairs and walking into the countryside and seeing the trees and visually that could be very easy for you to do and then an idea would be to start changing your the way you feel changing your state by gradually moving it into the auditory stage so you'd start hearing the birds in the tree and maybe you could hear the wind and notice the sound of the leaves underneath your feet and and then as you notice the feet the leaves underneath your feet you can introduce the kinesthetic and notice your feet on the ground and notice I feel physical when I talk when I'm saying this and noticing the wind in your face and it changes your state from what it was to start with that's how easily the state that we're in can be changed because you start moving into a different state by focusing on a different aspect of that experience. 
in the same way as if you're watching television and you turn the television off. Your experience changes in that room. Suddenly you're more aware of maybe background sounds that you weren't aware of before. Maybe more aware of the feeling of the chair underneath your body. Maybe more aware of the temperature in the room. More aware of you know, the breath going in and out of your mouth. Maybe more aware of your surroundings visually. The brightness of the room maybe or the darkness depending on how you feel, well, you know, what's going on, what your environment is. That's changing of state. That is part of hypnosis. That's part, but that's part of being alive. It's part of everyday experience. We change our states. So the idea behind some of these theories is if you're predominantly auditory and you can hear stuff, then maybe, and you can hear stuff, and you're, you're probably predominantly, you're f you focus on what you can hear, you focus maybe on talking, and maybe in a lecture, you could have your eyes closed and you could hear the lecturer or the person talking, and it's, um, maybe just more enjoyable or more uh, you can absorb more maybe by just listening rather than looking other people might need to look they might you know see a video seeing a video and seeing um, the writing and seeing screenshots and examples might be the best way to learn for them or physical people kinesthetic might need to do something with their hands actually physically interact and make something, create something, that might be a way of learning for them that they like. I think the ideal is to actually have all three working together. At least that way you, you find one way that's gonna help, one way that's gonna be useful, and maybe all of them. Because you know, we're, we're not just one thing. So yeah, I quite, I'm interested in that kind of stuff. And I think, so, I've got these feelings, I've got these thoughts. When I saw that YouTube dislike yesterday, it was just a visual, it's just a visual, see the dislike, and there is that trigger. It's a trigger to me like, oh, perhaps I should delete the video. Then I look on uh, iTunes and see that people are downloading it. People are what are listening to it. People are watching it on Vimeo. Like, okay, people are watched it. I did a live one on Facebook and I had, or 80, I think when I finished this, the session, I recorded it live, I'd had 66 people viewing or 70 or whatever. So people were watching. I don't think many people stayed and watched they, they, they It's hard to know with Facebook, but they were watching at some point. A few people stayed. So, it's noticing, I guess, what's going on in my mind. What goes on in your mind when something similar to that happens, when you start maybe there's a, a doubting going on within you. What's going on for you at that time? What can you do to change that? And I think it's okay to, it's nothing wrong really with having self-doubt because it's a natural thing to have but it's what you do with it you know it's like having stomach ache or needing to go to the toilet if you think of self-doubt like needing to go to the toilet then give it a little bit of attention and then flush it away 
I just went like that by the way I did a flush sound side with my hand or flush it away depending no, actually that might not be the right hand signal but the whole thing is you can give it attention and notice it where's it coming from is it your voice I had this uh, inner feeling and inner voice telling me that I was stupid for many 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 years right from the age of young young kid to well it still happens now sometimes but less so I think in a way I found my voice so uh, I'm kind of comfortable within myself um, I'm very I don't I'm not sure how I can explain that but I found my voice so I don't feel um, I don't really get belittled by other people but that could be to do with age just you know being around a while now um, various different things for that I guess but I used to think of myself as stupid and I used to get called stupid when I was younger by adults uh, children we used to call each other stupid anyway but that was just a standard thing but by adults never cared what really what the other kids thought really I suppose I did to a degree but not hugely maybe individuals if I liked them so uh, the whole thing is well why did I keep that going and in some ways I didn't do anything to disprove it because um, I thought I was stupid academically and I wasn't I didn't do anything really to do the fact is uh, nobody should think of themselves as stupid and I don't think anybody should be called stupid not by an adult as I said with kids calling each other stupid it's a different thing if adults are being rude to each other in an argument or you know just messing around that's a different thing I would say but if it's a bullying calling a child stupid is a bullying it's bullying it's demeaning it's putting that child down it's abuse really verbal abuse so emotional abuse and the more and more and more I heard it I guess the more and more that sunk deep inside me where I actually truly believed it I didn't question it it wasn't um, that's why because I didn't question it I didn't feel I was able to ever disprove that I took it as a fact because that's what I was told and there was no evidence to the contrary for me um, academically I've always been able to talk I've always been a verbal person uh, generally uh, I'll always like to read um, but when it came to academics I tried to do degrees probably tried about six six maybe seven times I tried to do degree courses uh, at colleges and you know with the Open University and I just couldn't get started on any of them uh, tried other Open University courses couldn't get started on them couldn't do them uh, I even did a massage course couldn't finish that did a reflexology course couldn't finish that um, it wasn't due to academic inability or it was due to my own belief self-belief because that self-doubt used to come and say well I can't do this and I don't deserve to be able to get that diploma and I'm not good enough and all that stuff used to come in the whole you know I'm I'm stupid used to kick in and then 
I think with the hypnosis, it reduced a bit. Once I started learning hypnosis, once I started realizing that actually I can learn things, but it has to be something that I'm interested in. So for example, I used to be interested in Buddhism in my early 20s, so I bought loads of books on Buddhism and Zen and read all that, you know, read them, loved them. I used to read lots of poetry. I used to read all the beat, no, I used to read a lot of the beat generation books, you know, Ginsberg, Kerouac, Give a Dog a Bone. Um, yeah, so lots of those ones. Um, Bukowski, although he's not officially like a beat book, beat generation book writer, but I read like a lot of his stuff. So I was very much into that, I did a lot of writing, but I never believed that I was capable of doing anything. Never believed that I was I could succeed. And I think I got that from, it's really weird, but working in an insurance company in sales and I became one of the top people there working there. Out of about 200, 250 or something salespeople, I was, I was like pretty much the number two slot. Sometimes I'd be number one, but there was one person that was, he was just way better than everybody. But I was definitely the number two. But sometimes I was number one, you know, on different weeks. So I, my self-esteem rose during that period. And my self-esteem has risen during periods of having female attention. That, that's been good for my self-esteem. Uh, not lately, but you know, in the past. But even then, I didn't feel clever. I didn't feel that I'd accomplished anything. I didn't feel academic even when I was doing the sales. I was just talking to people. So it wasn't that I was being academic. I didn't feel clever. But I didn't feel as stupid as I had. I wonder what you've done in the past. What you've done that has changed the way you feel about yourself. Something you can remember that actually goes against that self-sabotaging belief system that kicks in that may be keeping you back, holding you back, getting in the way of your happiness. What can be there to remind you, well actually, you know, actually I am good at this, actually I do deserve to be happy, actually you do deserve to have a good, happy life and to, to enjoy yourself. And then I did a degree in 2007, October, started a degree, or it might have been September, 2007, so it's over 10 years now ago, and I started a degree in counselling. I won't go through the process of what led me there, but um, it was hard. It was really hard, and it wasn't hugely academic. It was academic, I still had to do a dissertation and do lots of essays and assignments and stuff like that. Um, I was one of the top people probably when it came to the actual, um, the practical side of things. I say not, not the best, but top as in, um, well I was better, I can't, probably shouldn't say, I, I was much, better at the practical side than the academic side. Uh, I still did the academic side. Still did it and I had that self doubt kicking me the whole like the whole journey. Like keep telling me, but you're stupid, you're stupid, you can't do this. Give it up, give it up, give it up. And I didn't do it on my own. That's the thing. I didn't get through that on my own. And if it had been just me, I don't think I would have had the degree. And I did, I did uh, qualify and became a counsellor after the first two years, and then got my degree, bachelor's degree, after the third year. 
so I graduated in I think it was October or November 2010 so yeah eight seven or eight years ago seven years ago and I got help from more than one person on my course I got help from the teachers as well the tutors but there was like one particular person that just went out of her way to help me in especially perhaps in the last year where I was really wanting to leave because the dissertation was hard work it really just couldn't motivate myself to do it I did it in the end so you can overcome it you can push forward through that self doubt sometimes it can be a case of just going ahead anyway as what's her name is it Louisa Hay as I feel the fear and do it anyway and it's an easy sentence to say feel the fear and do it anyway it's such a it's such an easy sentence but to actually do it because it's it wasn't fun it wasn't fun some of it was fun but um, quite a lot of it wasn't enjoyable at all but I kept at it and I got my degree and you know in some ways there's someone calls me stupid which they don't really to be fair but I can always come back and say well I've got a degree I can't be that stupid and if one particular person that used to call me stupid when I was younger said it to me I can say well you don't have a degree I do so how can you call me stupid how can you judge me on my academic ability if yours isn't as high as mine although I wouldn't say that it's just it's nice to know that I could if it came to it because you can't get a degree if you're stupid and to be fair I don't think it's I don't even know what stupid means what does it mean we all do silly things everybody does we all do and maybe if you just change the word from silly to stupid or stupid to silly interchange it silly is such a nice gentle word stop being so silly silly Billy it's a gentle for me it has a gentle tone stupid is um, very harsh, very limiting, very kind of definite kind of a word and I may do stupid things and you may do stupid things at times but you're not stupid and I'm not stupid and maybe change that word from stupid to silly and notice how it changes now I'm going to start doing that. So if I'm doing something and I'm, I don't know, let's say I put a chair together, I buy a chair, get it set and it's in a box and I have to assemble it. I put it together and I sit down on it and I realise I've put it together upside down. Instead of calling myself stupid, I say, well, that was, that was silly. It's funny and silly. It's a bit of a kinder way, isn't it? Kinder way to, to treat yourself. Changing the word stupid to silly. Stop being so silly. What is silly Billy? It's kind of a childish thing. 
kind of a childish, young, something that you perhaps say to a, a small child. Oh, that was silly. And that's the thing with children that are spoken to harshly by their parents or whoever's bringing them up, raising them, or by their teachers or whoever, even maybe their friends' parents being called stupid or an idiot or things like that, or even worse. It's not acceptable. Sorry to break it to you. If you've got children and you're calling them stupid or an idiot, or if you're just being nasty, verbally abusive to them, then just think about it. Take a step back. Change the things you say. Realize that they're, they're children. They're not thinking the way the same as an adult. They can't, they don't have that ability to think the same as an adult because their brains are not formed that way yet. So they may do something that seems ridiculous, but it might not be ridiculous to them. Yeah. maybe if we all spoke to children the way we would speak to a policeman or woman I know not everybody has respect for the law I understand that but you know the general population would show it a bit of respect I imagine especially if the policeman's armed and got a gun out, pointing at you. How would you speak to that person? Would you swear at them or would you say, okay, yes. Would you be gentle? Would you be verbally gentle? I imagine, I know I would be very verbally gentle. I imagine, I hope, I hope so. So maybe you could do that with your child. How would you want to be treated? And some people say, well, I was treated I was hit when I was a kid and never did me any harm and uh, you know I know we're talking about hitting now rather than talking but and you and if you say to the person well how did you feel when you were being hit for something that you didn't even know why you were being punished for because you didn't feel that you'd done anything wrong but you were being screamed at and being a hit or sent to your bed and not have any dinner how did that feel? Is there one person who would answer that with, oh, it was great, it really felt nice. Yeah, I'm so glad my parents did it. I felt really, you know, at the time I just thought, oh, mother, oh, I'm really sorry for what I did and I really agree with your particular behavioral um, that's going on at the moment. I think that, uh, Really, I, I think I shall change. I think that because of the, the slapping and the shouting and the screaming, and I think that maybe my behavior will change from now on. Thank you very much for your input. Probably not. Probably not. It's, uh, it's quite, I don't know if ironic is the right word. Funny, I would say. Not funny, ha ha, but maybe ironic that when you see a child that's done something that's upset a parent it's the parent that sounds like the child it's the parent that often has the tantrum starts screaming, losing control shouting, screaming obscenities That's kind of funny, isn't it? It's not funny, ha ha, it's horrible. But isn't it weird that an adult would be the child? And the child is maybe sitting there thinking, 
What the heck's going on with this person? They're acting like a baby. I hope I'm not like that when I'm an adult. If I ever have kids, I'm not going to treat my kids like that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if every person, every child that had ever been verbally abused, maybe physically as well, all decided that they would never, ever, could never, would never treat a child that way. I know a lot do. But then there's, there's quite a lot that maybe think that, well, it's all right for me. I'll, I'll do it to them. I got it done to me. That logic. Forgetting the emotion, forgetting the pain, maybe. Maybe it's a similar thing as why people, why women have more than one baby. Because somehow they managed to forget <laughs> the pain and trauma they went through. Otherwise, I don't think anybody would ever have more than one child. So maybe that's what happens for people in childhood. They manage to somehow are able to forget that pain. Some people are. Of course, a lot of people don't. They're able to forget it enough to do it to other people. Wow. So, yeah. Make sure you don't do it. And if you are doing it, stop. And if someone's doing it to you, make sure that you tell somebody and make sure that it stops. Because now, I don't, it depends what country you're living in, of course. And there are some countries where people can pretty much do whatever they want. But in a lot of the countries now, especially in the Western world, um, there are laws. You're not allowed to hit a child. Seems weird, isn't it? You're allowed, to, you know, in the old days, you could hit a child, but not an adult. Hit a child around the head, but you couldn't hit, you couldn't walk up to someone in the street and hit them. Do you get arrested? So, those laws stand. If someone's hurting you, if you're young watching this, or whatever age you are, if you're at home, if you're an adult, and you've got a husband or a wife or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or brother or father or child hitting you. You don't have to put up with that. Seek help now, right this second. Never allow anybody to put their hands on you and hurt you. Ever. No, never. Never. So if your partner is, it's, it's the whole thing, it's, it can, I know it's difficult, but you know what? Sometimes, sometimes we all need to have a line that we don't go over, a, a, a line that you cannot be crossed a point where you say that's enough no more not going to happen no more that's it don't care what happens this will not happen again ever during my lifetime no one will ever do that to me again ever maybe we all need to have that moment So if you're one of those thousands or hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people out there in the world that somebody is hurting you, then it's time to say no more. Or as the great Roberto Duran said with his fight in his boxing, with his boxing Leonard, 
He said, no mass, no mass, no more, no more. We all need that, I think, for different things in our lives. We need to have, I forget what the right term for it is. I used to know the term. I used to talk about it quite a lot. We need to have that deal breaker. Is it a deal breaker? We all need a deal breaker. Someone hitting you is a deal breaker. The only time you should ever be hit, really, is if you step into a boxing ring or into the octagon for, to do mixed martial arts or maybe a karate tournament, something like that, then you might get hit. The idea is you'd still, even then, that you don't get hit, but it's not a big deal. If you get hit, you get hit. You've given the other person permission to attack you. It's the only time. If you're in your home, you should feel safe. Whether you're six months old or 98 years old or older or younger, you should be able to feel safe in your own home. You should be able to feel safe when walking to school or walking to college or walking to the shops, walking to work, get on a bus, train, driving. You should be able to feel safe doing all those things. So the word idiot can maybe still be used. Used for those people that hurt others, maybe. But then those people that are hurting others need help. But you know what? If you're living with someone that's hurting you, they may need help, but you're not the one to give them that help. You can maybe help them get that help, but technically you need to get out of that situation. Don't allow anybody to verbally or emotionally abuse you. Never. Have that as a deal breaker every time. That's a no-no. Not even if they're crying, saying it will never happen again, it's a one-off. No, that's it. Bye. Basically, if, you know, if a dog bites a neighbour, if you've got a dog and it bites the neighbour's child badly, no matter how much you love that dog, there's a very, very good chance your dog will be forced to be put down. And I know that could, that's got to be an awful thing to happen. There's a very strict rule. It's bitten once. We're not going to allow it to bite another child. You're not in a position to, um, well, I'm not in a position to stop someone from doing the same to another person, but you sure as hell can stop them from doing it to you. Seek help. Call the police. Get help from friends, family, whoever. Call the police. That's what they're there for. Don't allow anybody to harm you. Guys, this is turning into some kind of public broadcast now. It's important though, because whatever happens now is temporary. Unless you do nothing, then it's permanent, potentially. Make it temporary by doing something, taking action, seeking help. I can honestly say, hand on heart, honestly, 
whoever I was with, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, a girlfriend, if anybody struck me physically, that would be the end of that relationship, the end of that friendship. That would be it. That would be gone. No more. That's the minimum of what would happen. The bare minimum. So, I know that wasn't really what the beginning of this this thing was. We we're talking about self doubt, but it's about what causes self doubt. Is having somebody being horrible and saying horrible things to you and putting you down when you're younger or even when you're older it can have a huge inf influence. Self esteem, self doubt. It's not. It's not limited to children. If you're living with somebody, if you've got a partner, you could be in your 50s and 60s and still have be someone putting you down and, you know, being abusive, maybe physically even, as well as mentally and verbally, which can affect your self-esteem, your self-belief, and also your happiness. And the thing is, as long as you're thinking of that as a permanent situation, that's where it gets harder to change. When you realise, turn it into a temporary situation, pick the phone up, call the police. Don't allow anybody to hurt you. Of course, if they're being if they're put downs, isn't necessarily something you can call the police about, but emotional, emotional abuse can be. Get away from that situation. If someone's physically hurting you, then yeah, you can call the police. It's illegal. Get help, seek help. Change your life. Transform your life and tell other people and help them to transform theirs as well. No more. Hashtag no more. Or hashtag, I don't know, could be something like that. Could do a hashtag, you know, like the hashtag me too, which was recent. Could do a hashtag no more. No more put downs. No more violence, no more, you could just add whatever you want. Hashtag no more, N-O-M-O-R-E. Anyway, I'm going to go see you later. I know only about five people are going to watch this, so if you like what I do, please share so more people can enjoy looking at my shiny head. See you later. Uh, I just remind you, my website is jasonnewland.com. I've got a Vimeo. Uh, YouTube account, Facebook, Twitter, that will all be shared on, and my iTunes and SoundCloud will have the audio to, to listen to and to download. So I'm going to go and watch Big Brother, and I'm going to cook myself some dindins. So I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs>